Jonathan White, um, a lieutenant colonel in the Army who's retired and uh, who also has been work working on his doctorate at Alabama and got his doctorate and wrote a wonderful dissertation, which I've read. Um, I'm hoping the publisher he sent it to doesn't publish it because Abbey will, Abbeville should publish it. Um, I called him about that once in a while <coughs> to see how it's going. Anyway, his father had a serious uh, heart attack. He's 85 in intensive care. And John, as he was going out the door, just found this out and, and, and uh, mentioned it, uh, wrote me about it yesterday. Uh, so he can't be here. But he sent his paper. And I think it's a very good paper. And he would like for, for me to read it, for somebody to read it. And so I'm going to read it. Uh, it's on three disenfranchisements. Um, and I'll try to read it from a computer. I've never read anything from a computer. And I might mess up the lines with a scroll. OK. The original sin of the new birth of freedom. Before I begin, I need to take a diversion into colonial history. Uh, Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, and its instructions to the members of the North Carolina legislature from November 1776 deserve much more attention than they garner today. In constitutional literature, Mecklenburg County was something of a backwater, and these instructions were not authoritative because the voters of Mecklenburg County issued them. Mecklenburg issued them because these beliefs were widespread and they were authoritative. Mecklenburg stated, and what it's stating, he says, is just what was in the air. Everybody knew it. First, and this is from the resolves, political powers of two kinds, one principal and superior, the other derived and inferior. The principal supreme power is possessed by the people at large. The derived and inferior power by the servants which they employ. Four, third, whatever persons are delegated, chosen, employed, and entrusted by the people are their servants and can possess only derived inferior power. Whatever is constituted and, or, and ordained by the principal supreme power cannot be altered, suspended, or abrogated by any other power. But the same power that ordained may after suspend and abrogate its own ordinances. <clears throat> the rules whereby the inferior power is to be exercised are to be constituted by the principal supreme power and can be altered, suspended, and abrogated by the same and no other. No authority can exist or be exercised but what shall appear to be ordained and created by the principal supreme power or by derived inferior power, which the principal supreme power hath authorized to create such authority. That the derived inferior power can by no construction or pretense assume or exercise a power to subvert the principal supreme power. That's pretty good for a backwater country. <laughs> and that, that county is Mecklenburg County, where, where I lived uh, after we moved from South Carolina. I went to high school in Charlotte. And Mecklenburg County uh, claims to have seceded May, in May of 1775. <laughs> Just got out of the British Empire by itself. <laughs> Colonial era voting. Virginia held the first representative assembly in British North America in 1619. Other colonies followed suit, and each colony set its own requirements for the franchise. In 1736, the Virginia House of Burgesses set the requirement at 100 acres of, of unimproved land or 25 acres of improved land um, had to be owned for at least one year before voting. One author estimates that in Virginia, two-thirds of white men could vote by mid-century, 18th century. Two-thirds. The reason for the property requirement was the idea that a voter needed to have some attachment to the community. 
voters, so the reasoning went, should be, quote, personally independent and had a vested interest in the welfare of their communities, end quote. The idea that paupers and wards of the state might have a hand in directing the affairs of the community would be a strange one to the founders. Over the antebellum period, ever more voters receive franchise. Uh, that's the title of the uh, section. At the founding of the republic, states exclusively determined who could vote. Most states allowed only white male adult property owners to vote. The term used was a freehold. A certain acreage or value of property held free and clear of debts. Debts. Uh, how many of us have a freehold? <laughs> Ex-slaves could vote in four states. Women could vote in New Jersey and, uh, until 1807, provided they could meet the property requirement. And in Pennsylvania, free blacks could vote until the state disenfranchised them later. In general, however, the trend line was for ever greater extending of the franchise. By 1856, white men were allowed to vote in all states, regardless of property ownership, although five states required payment of taxes. The first great disenfranchisement, 19, 1861. The people of the southern states went to the polls and decided how they were going to react to the election of the first Republican president. By the standards of the day, these elections were generally democratic. Local county leaders would canvass local elites on their positions on how to react to the election of Lincoln. These local elites would declare their policy if elected, either at a county meeting or a letter to the local paper. And voters would elect delegates based on their positions. In some cases, immediate unilateral secessionists won. In some cases, opponents of immediate secession won. In some cases, cooperationists won. Cooperationists represented a range of opinion. Some were worried that if their state seceded, they would risk facing the wrath of the federal government alone. So they wanted to enter into an agreement with other states to secede together before uh, that happened. Other cooperationists <clears throat> wanted to propose one final compromise. And if the northern states would not agree to that compromise, then the southern states could secede in good conscience. Essentially, these were secessionist positions, just what one might call go slow secessionism. There is something of a cottage industry in academia today that argues that these elections were not democratic. This was stated by unionists at the time <coughs> as an excuse for the failure of Southern unionism. One author, an Auburn alumni, I mean, these are Southern unionists who, who say this. Uh, a fact which, as an Alabama alumni, tickles me. He got his degree from Auburn. Argued that James Eason, a North Georgia unionist, had been intimidated out of voting. When I checked the sources cited, the post-war Southern Claims Commission, it turns out that Eason said that the choices on offer were between immediate unilateral secession and a cooperationist's position. Faced with the alternative of an immediate secession or cooperationist, Eason refused to vote for either. Quote, there was only about five or six days difference between them, he said. There is no evidence, end quote, uh, uh, there is no evidence that secessionists intimidated pro-union voters in heavily uh, secessionist counties. 
more than pro-union voters intimidated secessionist voters in heavily pro-union counties, except perhaps that secessionists were simply bad people, while unionists were upright and honorable people. <clears throat> These state secession votes were democratic. Eleven states opted to leave the union uh, leave the Union. Tennessee seceded by act of the legislature plus a referendum. Virginia and Texas seceded by state convention plus a plebiscite. The other eight, South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, North Carolina, and Arkansas, seceded by action of the conven of a convention of the people of that state called to vote on the matter. <coughs> The same bodies that had adopted the Constitution and joined the Union, a convention of the people. That's what got them into the Union in the first place, and only that authority could take them out of the Union. The legislature couldn't do it, would not have the authority. That was Calhoun's position and, uh, as well. In South Carolina, the convention vote was unanimous. Elsewhere, it was contested. But generally, these elections were democratic, according to the standards of the day, or even our standards. <laughs> the decision of around one million Southern voters was to leave the Union. Then the United States fought a war to suppress that exercise of democracy. Here it is important to recall the Mecklenburg instructions. In in any disagreement between the people whose power, whose political power was principal and supreme, and the holders of federal office whose power was derived and inferior, the people were right and the office holders were wrong by definition, except in Lincoln's United States. So we have a revolution going on, a revolution, not a civil war. America's French Revolution. To put a finer point on the characterization, the Lincoln administration showed how much it respected government of the people, by the people, and for the people in Maryland. In September 1861, the Maryland legislature decided to convene in Frederick because Annapolis was too close to a rowdy Baltimore. One of the agenda items might have been the decision to hold a state convention to decide how Maryland should respond to events. Secretary of War Simon Cameron acted decisively, doubtless with Lincoln's prior knowledge and approval. Cameron, Cameron wrote General Banks in September 11th, quote, the passage of any act of secession by the legislature of Maryland must be prevented. If necessary, all and any part of the members must be arrested. Exercise your own judgment as to the time and manner, but do the work effectively." End quote. <clears throat> On September 17th, General Banks reported that, quote, all members of the Maryland legislature assembled at Frederick City on the 17th instant, known or suspected to be disloyal, and their relations to the government have been arrested." End quote. Notice there's only one government, the government. There's not a federation of governments, um, but just the government. At the end of the, what was on the table at the end of the war, President Lincoln had always said, has always been clear about the political objective of the war, preservation of the Union. Over the course of the war, he added the goal of, ex of ending slavery. At the Hampton Roads Conference in February 1865, Lincoln made this explicit. When the Confederate military situation collapsed in April, white Southerners bowed to the inevitable and accepted peace. Soldiers took their paroles and following the guidance of Robert E. Lee went home to rebuild their fortunes. Southern states repealed their ordinances of secession. Repealed them. Every ex-Confederate state but Mississippi, Florida, and Texas approved the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery. So they're back in the Union. 
At the close of the war, Virginia conservative Alexander H. Stewart said, quote, we were assured that upon the repeal of the ordinance of secession, the repudiation of the Confederate debt, and emancipation of the slaves, we would be restored to our rights in the Union, end quote. It was not that simple. The second great disenfranchisement. Politics continued apace, however, and Southern states were back in the Union, and how could they have ratified an amendment to the Constitution if they were not in the Union? The former Confederate states held elections for Congress. In November 1865, the Philadelphia Ledger reported that members of the Republican Party were contemplating not seating Southern delegations, end quote. Parson Br Brownlow, the East Tennessee miscreant, as, as Mr. White, Dr. White calls them, uh, he was a piece of work, um, felt that the war had ended two years too soon and urged Republicans not to seat Southern delegations. You needed two more years to really scorch the place and drive uh, Confederates into the sea, he said, uh, or ex-Confederates. The problem was that Southern states elected congressional delegate, uh, sorry, the problem was that Southern states elected congressional delegations who could not take the oath. Now here's the oath they had to take. I, A, B, or some such, do solemnly swear and affirm that I have never voluntarily borne arms against the United States since I have been a citizen thereof, that I have voluntarily given no aid, countenance, counsel, or encouragement to persons engaged in armed hostility thereto, that I have never sought nor accepted or attempted to exercise the functions of any office whatsoever under any authority or pretended authority in hostility to the United States, that I have not yielded a voluntary support to any pretended government authority, power, or constitution within the United States, hostile or inimical thereto. And I do further swear or, or affirm that, I, uh, that to the best of my knowledge and ability, I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I, will bear the, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this position, this <coughs> obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will <clears throat> well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter, so help me God. Southern states acted on the peace settlement on the table in 1865 and were about electing representatives to Congress and went about electing representatives to Congress. Alabama, for example, elected five Whigs who had opposed secession and one Democrat, former a Confederate general, and native New Yorker, Lewis Parsons, a Democrat, uh, and native Tennessean, George Houston, a Democrat, were elected to the United States Senate. But they were denied their seats despite the fact that the Congress stipulates, quote, the, con the, Congre the, um, the Constitution, should be the Constitution, stipulates, quote, no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate, end quote. All the representatives but Battle, uh, Mr. Battle, had opposed secession. Had opposed secession in 1861. So these were not extreme states' rights men, but none could take the oath. In South Carolina, James Hamilton Farrow of Lawrence had served in the Confederate Congress and the state convention which repealed the ordinance of secession. He was elected to the United States Senate, of, United States House of Representatives, but also denied his seat. Virginia was also treated in an anti-democratic manner. Joseph E. Seeger of King William County and John C. Underwood, a northern man, were elected to the Senate. Both were denied seats in the Senate. 
congressional candidates, Alexander Stewart, Robert Conrad, who had opposed secession won seats in the House of Representatives but were denied their seats. It was the same story for all the southern states. The southern delegates were not called in the roll call and were not permitted to plead their case. The voters of the former Confederate states were simply disenfranchised. The new democratic realities in Virginia did not compare favorably with Virginia's past. In Alexandria, the vote cast was 8,670, less than had been cast in the same district in 1860. The same people who bleated so bitterly about voter intimidation in 1861 are strangely silent about this drop in voter participation. Remember that Virginia had approved the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery. So Virginia had been in the Union as of that date and had done nothing since April 1865 to change that status, except it failed to elect Republicans to Congress. For that sin, the voters of Virginia were entirely disenfranchised. What was to be done, the Richmond Whig rendered a pragmatic opinion. It is no use for us to be guilty of the folly of butting our heads against immovable walls. We must take things as we find them and we must accept facts as they are and devote all of our thoughts and energies to the single end of getting back under the protection of the Constitution and the laws of the United States. Of course, one might ask, how did the southern states get out from under the protection of the Constitution and the laws of the United States? Were they warned in April 1865 that if they gave up the fight, they would find themselves not protected by the Constitution, denied representation in Congress in violation of the Constitution? Are they to be condemned if they felt the goalposts had been moved after the ball had been kicked? At any rate, the people of the southern states were disenfranchised for a second time. <clears throat> the radical Republicans were presented with a problem. What was to be done with ex-Confederate states that did not send Republican delegates, delegations to Congress? Thaddeus Stevens said, quote, they ought never to be recognized as capable of acting in the Union or of being counted as valid states until the Constitution shall have been so amended as to make it what its framers intended and so as to secure perpetual ascendancy to the party of the Union. That's what the founders intended. They intended an indivisible state and only the Republicans stood for that. And so as to render our Republican government firm and stable forever, end quote. So the Republicans settled upon a dual track approach, disenfranchise voters who seemed intent on voting for the wrong men and find new voters who would vote for Republicans, the freedmen and imported white northerners. General William Sherman was no fan of this approach. Sherman said of this, quote, the whole idea of giving the vote to the Negroes was to create just that many votes to be used by others for political purposes, end quote. Sherman disapproved of enfranchising African Americans so that, quote, politicians may manufacture just so much more pliable electioneering material, end quote. Senator James Dixon of Connecticut said that, quote, the purpose of the radicals was the saving of the Republican Party rather than the saving of the Union, end quote. Third disenfranchisement. The third disenfranchisement was more complicated. It varied from state to state and time to time. But Republicans and their allies became addicted to disenfranchising their opponents. They got in the habit of it.
That's called national sovereignty, which is inimical to any kind of independent social authority in the regime. In Virginia, the General Assembly voted down the 14th Amendment, and for this sin was effectively prorogued. Then the state became military district number one. Virginia, the what is it? The, the land of the, the land of presidents and statesmen, the, the, the mother of states and the mother of states and, and, and presidents, was now just military district number one. Sounds like Orwell. Carry me back to old military district number one. <laughs> Military District Number One, headed by Union General John Schofield. Schofield arbitrarily removed county officers from their posts and appointed to replace them men unknown to the community and lacking the skills to carry out the office. Governor Pierpont, Pierpont <clears throat> the Quisling governor of Rump, Virginia, was left in the governor's mansion. But merely as a figurehead, the real executive power resided with Schofield. Schofield, in turn, removed Pierpoint from office April 4, 1867. Schofield directed the state to hold a convention to draft a new state constitution. Historian James Eckenrude wrote, quote, Congressional acts prevent many Confederates from voting and almost all from holding office for the test oath was required of all office holders." End quote. Schofield directed a registration of eligible voters. An indication of how stringent the registration was, James R. Bub Rudd, Bub Rudd, nickname, had volunteered to join the Old Dominion Rifles of Alexander before the war. The unit was called up and sent to Winchester. Rudd did not want to fight against the Union, so he deserted and was eventually discharged before the first of Manassas, um, July 21, 1861, and went to live in Union-occupied Alexandria. He joined the Union League. When he went to register, a black member of the Seventh War Republican Club challenged his right to register. A Union general named Bacon denied Rudd the right to register to vote. This demonstrates how stringent the registration was. Recall the Mecklenburg instructions again. Voting for office holders under a constitution was one thing, since their authority would be, quote, derived and inferior. Voting for delegates to a state convention charged with drafting a new state constitution was something else. Since this power is, quote, principal and superior, disenfranchising a significant portion of the voting population in such a case is much more serious, and yet this was what the radicals <coughs> did. The election was held October 1821 um, through 18 to 18 through the 21st, 1867. There were 120,000 white voters and 106,000 black voters registered. So that's the breakdown: 120,000 whites, 106,000 blacks. But General Schofield had gerrymandered the districts to ensure Republican a radical outcome. 44,000 of the white registered voters, disgusted with the farce, did not even vote. The results were predictable. 72 radical delegates, 47 white, 25 black, and 33 conservative delegates were elected. The most momentous decision to come out of the convention was that of the franchise. <clears throat> Radicals proposed to give the franchise to all freemen but denied it to many ex-Confederates. Conservatives countered that, quote, no Republican government could succeed unless the electors possessed intelligence, moral culture, and a property stake, end quote. Radical James Honeycutt declared, 
He favored disenfranchising 30,000 more than were already disenfranchised by Congress. Radical delegate Orrin Hine suggested disenfranchising, quote, every Confederate who had been a senator, congressman, presidential elector, who had held any civil or military office under the United States and had taken the oath of allegiance to the United States, end quote. This was adopted. <clears throat> Hine wanted to disenfranchise everyone who had ever advocated secession. A look at the referendum in 1861 will reveal that this would have been most of the white population. This was too much, even for the radicals. <clears throat> the Virginia Constitution, as adopted, guaranteed the franchise to all men except federal or state officials who had, quote, engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States, or given aid and comfort to those who did. In July 1869, the people of the state adopted the new state constitution and rejected the provision disenfranchising ex-Confederates. Virginia finally rejoined the Union. The Republicans were not content to overthrow ex-Confederate states. A committee of Republican representatives in 1867 went to investigate whether Maryland had a, quote, Republican form of government, as required by the Constitution of the United States. The obvious implica implication was that if American, Maryland was determined not to have a Republican form of government, then the radicals in Congress could overthrow the current state government and reconstruct Maryland as well, even though Maryland had never seceded. But it might not have a Republican form of government. And central authority will determine whether it has one or not. The obvious implication, uh, well, I read that. The New York Irish citizen believed that Maryland, quote, is a republic and a state in the Union whenever and so long as its affairs are governed by members of the Republican Party and not otherwise and not one moment longer, end quote. Maryland in the end dodged the bullet and the state government was not overthrown. But the fact that this was even considered shows how much Northern radicals were ad addicted to disenfranchisement. How did white Southerners react to all this? White Southerners applied the lesson learned from their Yankee schoolmasters. If you cannot defeat your opponents and they insist on voting incorrectly, gain the upper hand by simply disenfranchising them. <laughs> Seems sensible. We all doubtless know the story of how white Southerners employed violence and intimidation to drive down black voting during Reconstruction and thereafter. But this violence and intimidation should be, part, should be put in its broader context. White Southerners were not the only ones denying their opponents the right to vote. The Union League, founded in the North during the war as an adjunct to the, uh, to the Republican Party, spread south once the fighting stopped. Northern whites came south and instructed freedmen on how to vote. One Southern newspaper editor called the Union League clubs, quote, infamous workshops of radical malignity, end quote. The League also was a mechanism for enforcing party loyalty. The Union League took a particularly dim view of African Americans who voted, quote, the wrong way, i.e. for Democrats, and took extraordinary measures to ensure black racial solidarity. So here we begin to get racial solidarity in politics. Historian Walter Fleming of the Dunning School wrote of how the League dealt with black voters disloyal to the Republican Party. Quote from, from uh, Fleming. In the opinion of the League, white Democrats were bad enough, but black Democrats were not to be tolerated. 
The first rule was that all blacks must support the radical program. It was possible in some cases for a Negro to refrain from taking an active part in political affairs. He might even fail to vote, but it was martyrdom for a black to be a Democrat, that is, try to follow his, his old master in politics. <coughs> If moral suasion failed to cause the delinquent to see the light, other methods were used. Threats were common from the first and often sufficed, and fines were levied by the League on recalcitrant members. In the case of the more stubborn and sound beating, in, in the case of the more stubborn, a sound beating was usually effective to bring about a change of heart. The offending freedman was bucked and gagged, and that's a quote, and the thrashing administered, <coughs> administered, the sufferer being afraid to complain of the way he was treated. There were many cases of aggravated assault and a few instances of murder. By such methods, the organization succeeded in keeping under its control almost the entire Negro population. The discipline over the active members was stringent. They were sworn to obey the orders of the officials. A Negro near Clayton disobeyed the captain of the league, and he was tied up by the thumbs, and another, for a similar offense, was bucked and whipped, end quote. I'm not sure what bucking is, but it doesn't sound good. <laughs> similar cases of violent enforcement to party loyalty were seen in other southern states. For example, in May 1868, Wiley Taylor, a black man from, Cal from North Carolina, committed the sin of voting for the conservative Democrat ticket. For this sin, Major Joe Totten, a carpetbagger and local leader of the Union League, ordered the black members of the League to arrest Taylor and bring him before the Union League at Battleboro for trial. Taylor's life was threatened for his conservative principles. When Totten, in turn, was arrested by the sheriff and brought to trial, he was convicted, but appealed his conviction to the military governor in Raleigh. A journalist reporting on the case wrote that it was important that the people of the state, quote, should know which they are to obey, the oaths and orders of the Union League or the regular laws of the state." End quote. The same story was repeated elsewhere. In Columbus, Georgia, an African-American named Welch Love announced that he intended to vote the Democratic ticket. He was asked to explain to the local Union League, but did not show up. Later, Love explained that the night before his address, Union League members had surrounded his house and threatened his life and the lives of his family. Black Southerners were not the only victims of Union League threats. Richmond Dispatch reporter James uh, Cowardin received a letter from Nat H. Barrett, president of the local Union League, ordering him to leave Richmond within 48 hours, quote, under penalty of death, end quote. Cowardin took the threat seriously enough that he did leave Richmond. In Wilson County, North Carolina, a white man named Zeno Green got into an altercation with a black man, Dave Russell, in, whom, in which Russell was shot and wounded. Green was arrested and released on bond. Bill Grimes, the African-American president, of the local Union League gave a speech from the courthouse steps in which he urged the burning of houses and the killing of whites. That night, Grimes was seen near Green's barn. <clears throat> Just before the barn was set on fire, Green and his family, fearing for their lives, <coughs> were too afraid to go outside to fight the fire." End quote. This was, in th that was not an end quote, sorry. This was, environment, this was the environment in which Congressional Reconstruction played out. By the 1890s, according to author Michael Perman, in Struggle for Mastery, white Southern Democrats had graduated from voter intimidation 
to structural means of disenfranchisement. For example, the introduction of the secret ballot reduced voting by the illiterate. In other cases, Democrats resorted to constitutional prohibitions. Virginia, for example, adopted the Understanding Clause. A prospective voter would present himself before the county register, registrar, and the registrar would select a paragraph from the Virginia Constitution. If the applicant demonstrated that he adequately understood, understood the paragraph, the registrar would register the application, applicant as a voter. If not, the applicant could not register. County registrars were appointed by the state legislature, controlled by Democrats, and had wide authority. In this way, Virginia Republicans, white and black, were disenfranchised. So it was payback time. The legacy of the original sin of the new birth of freedom. The Selma Civil Rights Museum shows clearly the transparently fraudulent means county registrars use in Alabama to, <laughs> to deny black applicant, um, applicants the ability to register to vote. Applicant, an applicant for applicants for registration were told, quote, Mr. Jones handles voter registration and he just went to lunch. Come back tomorrow. The next day, the applicant would be told, Mr. Jones is out sick today. Come back tomorrow. Then we're out of forms. Then Mr. Jones is on vacation, et cetera, et cetera. And a never-ending snipe hunt for black men and women seeking to register. The reaction to Southern disenfranchisement, however, has in some cases been worse than the disease. The Justice Department and the federal judiciary have discovered that the phrase, quote, disproportionate impact, end quote, trumps the entire Constitution. If any state policy has a disproportionate impact on minorities, it is ipso facto unconstitutional. For example, directing voter produce, for example, directing voter produce a photo identification to prove that they are who they say they are is unconstitutional because it is harder for minorities to get photo IDs than whites without any real explanation as to why this is the case. So we continue this thing. The effect of this in turn has been total disenfranchisement. Today, most Americans believe that every American citizen should vote. Some believe residents who are not American citizens should vote. In California, for example, non-citizen resident aliens can vote in local elections. Next, even verifying that registered voters are legally authorized to vote and are alive you think at least that, but anyway, is, 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 is racist, is racist. In 1994, Democrats pushed to make it easier to register to vote with the Motor Voter Bill. More voting is better, advocates said, and urged that voters be allowed to register at the local division of motor vehicles. Skeptics argued that people should who should not be voting, for example, felons, non-citizens, would register using uh, something as impersonal as the uh, DMV, whose primary function is not registering voters. As a sop to skeptics, advocates of the bill included a provision in the bill that anyone, uh, that anyone could get a copy of the list of registered voters and check it against lists of felons, non-citizens and the deceased. So, you know, if you have a problem, go check it out. When the public, when the public interest legal foundation attempted to verify voter register rosters in Virginia, they got the rosters of eight counties. In these eight counties, they found 1,046 aliens registered to vote. 
and they cast 200 votes. Edgardo Cortez, the commissioner of the Virginia Department of Elections, appointed the carpetbagger governor, Terry McAuffle. <laughs> Wait a minute. Mc I should know his name, but I mean, how do you pronounce it? McAuffle? Macaulay. McAuffle. Anyway. Uh, uh, then, then ordered count. Okay, then, then ordered county registrars in every other county, in violation of the Motor Voter Act, to deny the P. Let's read that over again. Um, McAuliffe. McAuliffe. Okay. Edgardo Cortez, the commissioner of the Virginia Department of Elections, appointed the carpetbagger governor. Terry McAuliffe, then ordered county registrars in every other county in violation of the Motor Voter Act to deny the PILF request, the uh, Public Interest Legal Foundation. We do not know how many aliens were or not registered to vote in Virginia. Again, because of the magic of the disparate impact registration applicants, eligibility to vote, God. <laughs> These sentences are strange. I mean, there are errors in here. I have to back up and, Mike, let's do this again. We do not know how many aliens were or not registered to vote in Virginia. Again, because of the magic of the disparate uh, impact registration applicants, el eligibility to vote consists of nothing more than checking a box declaring they are eligible. It is in effect nothing more than the honor system. Requiring anything more than that would have a disparate impact, Supreme Court language, on minorities and would therefore be unconstitutional. This is the legacy of voting in Reconstruction. The, non, the radical Republicans embraced mass disenfranchisement of their political opponents. If slavery was the original sin of the founding of the American Republic, then disenfranchisement is the original sin of the new birth of freedom. Southern Democrats learned their opponents' lesson only too well. When they got a chance to control matters, they disenfranchised their political opponents, Republicans. The, the reaction to that, in turn, has swept away even the most common sense controls of the franchise. Even the most common sense controls. Instead of making sure that everyone who should be voting gets a vote, now we find ourselves in the situation in which one political party wants everyone to vote, even those who have no right to vote.